This podcast is supported by Wesleyan Financial Services, providers of specialist financial advice to members of the legal profession. Wesleyan's team of dedicated experts have been helping law firms and their employees achieve financial well-being over many years, providing personal and commercial financial advice, in-firm seminars and online guidance. Strategic partners with the Law Society, Wesleyan is proud of its partnership with Women in the Law UK. For more information about Wesleyan, visit wesleyan.co.uk or to arrange a financial education event in your firm or a no-obligation financial health check, connect with Sarah Deacon, Wesleyan Area Manager on LinkedIn. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. I'm Sally Penny, a barrister based in Manchester at Kenworthy's Chambers and a joint vice chair of the Association of Women Barristers. I'm also the founder of Women in the Law UK, an organisation which is passionate about supporting the next leaders in law. We put on regular events, host masterclasses and also enjoy an annual dinner and conference. Do come and learn more about what we do at womeninthelawuk.com. You could also connect with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us on LinkedIn. Just search for Women in the Law UK. On this episode, I'll be talking law to Kirsty Brimlow, QC. An expert in international human rights law, Kirsty is a very senior barrister, part of one of the most eminent sets in the world, Doughty Street Chambers. She was also elected the first female chair of the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales and completed a six-year term in December 2018. As we recorded our interview during lockdown for COVID-19, there are times when you might hear technology glitch a little. So please do bear with me. Thank you. I asked Kirsty about her journey into the law. Well, I have a really unexciting answer as to why going into law in the first place in that I'm from a working class family where people didn't go to university and so when my generation myself and my sister had that opportunity to pursue further education it was within a framework that you had to really choose a proper degree and a proper degree was not seen as something such as english or french or 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 a degree which hadn't got an obvious profession attached to it and so it really drilled down to law or medicine and those were my choices and that was really the very narrow little sphere in which I operated and it was quite a straightforward choice because I really wasn't any good at sciences and so I could never have become a a medic. My sister went on to become a vet actually so she she swerved slightly from the doctor to to treat animals but she was always very strong on the science side And, and there we were and there I was then applying for law. I in retrospect would probably have changed that I wouldn't have changed the experiences I had and the people I've met and the friendships I made, who are still actually my really close friends from those university days. Fantastic. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your role models and who inspired you. You said you were from a working class background, so uh, I don't know if you were educated by the state or, or, or so on. And whether any of those things, role models, inspirations, whoever they were, have forged your desire to specialise in criminal law, human rights law? Yeah, I mean, I suppose we all are in some ways creatures of our of our upbringing. And, and although it feels a little strange at my great age to be talking about me as a kid and my mum and dad, they are clearly big influences, inevitably, as how you see the world. And as to how I ended up where I have. I've always probably been quite a campaigner uh, and uh, an advocate for those people who haven't had a voice. And when I was a child, that manifested itself in me going around my estate, trying to get a petition for sealed pots who were being clubbed to death. And so I was very much then really upset 
I also I remember very distinctly as a child I was about eight or nine and I had the task of collecting the the wages for my 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 mum both my parents were out that particular evening she was working as a sewist and she was paid literally 20p a hem 50p a zip it was that kind of very small amount of money even back then it was tiny amounts of money and she was sewing for a catalog her boss gave me the packet with her money in it and he said i've deducted 50p because the zip and he, he held up the zip in front of me and he basically said the zip isn't straight and I remember looking at the zip thinking there's nothing wrong with it. He's ripping her off. And I, I it was one of those, I can still actually picture him now. Mm. And I think even as a kid, I felt that real disparity in terms of power and in terms of really access to any kind of remedy because, you know, basically everybody just accepted it and then off you went. And it was people like my mum who were really the people who were exploited and that's never really changed and I think that kind of sense of how others could act towards people who didn't have their position and their resources I think that's always probably stayed with me and, I, and in some ways it's probably quite natural therefore that I ended up in a situation in law where I was always acting for defendants for claimants for people who were the most vulnerable. Yes, yes, quite. Well, I just on that then, I, I wonder, do you have a, a memorable case or a case that perhaps made you or has always stuck with yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, Sally, I, I think you probably will have experienced this yourself. Sometimes the cases that are written about in the newspapers or you know, in the media, whatever, aren't necessarily the ones that are going to impact as much on you personally. Sometimes it's the kind of small, particularly when you start as a barrister, it's those tiny victories and, and difference that you make. For me, I, I was, as a, as, a, as a pupil, I was running around the, the county court, around the magistrates court, family proceedings court. I was in all those areas in, in common law. And so I really learned a lot. And there was a lot of those cases at that time where I succeeded against the odds or against the expectation of my opponent that I think really formed me. One case that stuck in my mind, I was probably in practice about five years and it was an appeal. I appealed a conviction from the uh, Crown Court to the Court of Appeal. And I was against a prosecutor who was very, very senior. And it was one of those cases where the sort of general opinion was I had no chance. And as you will know, it's very difficult to get a conviction quashed. It's obviously easier with sentence. And it was a really a hard-edged legal argument. And I was successful. The conviction was quashed. There was some degree of praise for my written submissions. And it was one of those situations where probably I thought, yeah, I'm, I, I'm good at this. I can do this. And probably up until then, and probably since then as well, I thought I'm actually quite a good advocate. But how good am I as a lawyer with that, you know, that actual you know, heart, the black letter stuff. And and so I think that was quite seminal for me. And it also may help me really put confidence in my own judgment. And I think that's really important as a lawyer. If you feel your judgment, you get this feeling, no, no, this isn't right, I can win this. And then you 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 can start to rely on yourself and your judgment, then that is a really good thing to have. Absolutely. And that's great advice actually for, for many of us. Kirstie, can, can I ask you about some of your international work? How did that uh, arrive, if you like? You chaired the Bar Human Rights for years, brilliantly. So how did you develop or how did that sort of international work, which has led you to not being in the country for some of the time, how did that come, up, come about? I, I've always been curious about different cultures, different religions, different countries and, and hence I've always been a big traveller and I've learned so much through exploring the world and 
in some ways, when I found that actually I could combine work in other countries with that real joy I get at being in in, in a unfamiliar and sometimes very challenging environments, I was quite astonished because probably when I started working in international human rights, it wasn't really something that was talked about. There was no within university law courses, there was no particular, you know, there was no international human rights courses like there are now. And and the closest we probably got, there was public law, there was constitutional constitutional law, but you certainly didn't have international law as a choice. Uh, or if it was, it was it was focused more specifically around Europe, around the European Union. There was uh, part of the law degree did did focus on that rather than looking at UN mechanisms and so on. But I've always worked alongside charities. I've I've worked uh, advising charities really ever since I I've been qualified and charities carrying out humanitarian work. But I think. Yeah, the real change for me with my career was when I first got involved with the Bar Human Rights Committee and went to Jamaica. So that was my first real project for BHRC. And I was working on death row cases in Jamaica, and that was in 2005. And I worked there for two months. And then I started building up work from working with those lawyers on death penalty cases and carried on doing more work within BHRC. I was on the executive itself for about 15 years. And yeah, a long time. And then I was chair in the end from up until 2000 and 18 so six years and I was the first female chair uh, because part of it as well I, I you know I was like it, it, as an organization this is the bar human rights committee and it's never had a woman heading <laughs> it which seemed in itself a contradiction in terms and and what I was very pleased about with that organization was also being able to support other women and I had two brilliant women vice chairs and the chair now is a woman and it's now entirely normal as it should be to have women in the in those top top positions I think it's sort of developed but the Bar Human Rights Committee had a big big part to play in that and it and with its connections it introduced me to just about every NGO you could you could mention, uh, and and also started to introduce me into areas of work that I wasn't familiar with, and so I I, I just immersed myself to become an expert in international human rights, in particular some international public law. And also I, I got my, I had to, because a lot of the work I do now is in Spanish. So I had to get my Spanish pretty much fluent. I'm, I, you know, it's not entirely fluent. It takes such a long time, but, you know, I can work very comfortably in Spanish now, but that was a, that was an essential language as well. That's amazing. Crikey, I thought there was something you couldn't do. <laughs> Well, I wonder, having been the first female chair of that uh, association, really, and then you've gone on to, uh, to chair many others, you're actively involved in some of our professional organisations, and of course, being a big part of women in criminal law, you know, what do you think about gender diversity in our profession? Yeah, we're definitely getting better, but the progress is really slow. My view is you need to tackle this very early on in educational establishments, in schools and then in universities. And you need to not only tackle the obvious bias and discrimination, and we still are seeing those cases at, at the bar within the legal profession, but you need to tackle the subconscious bias. And, and that goes across absolutely everybody, not only the barristers, the solicitors, but it's it's a whole lot the clients so so everybody can get caught up with this uh, idea of the person that is best able to actually represent me as a lawyer needs to look a certain way and that certain way inevitably is is the 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 white public school educated male way i know lord sumption a couple of years ago was making the point against positive discrimination and he was saying well, if we're carrying on at the rate we're going, then in 50 years' time, there might be a writing of the gender disparity within the legal profession. But I really push back against that. It's like 50 years, don't say to me 50 years is a small point in history. 
it might be, but it, it, it's it's ridiculous. You cannot look at the retrograde progression of the legal profession and use that as some kind of measuring bar as to how we should shuffle along in the future. So we're doing more, but we need to do much, much more. And we, we're really behind many, many countries. Yes. What do you think our male colleagues could do, perhaps, or each of us could do in our own right, whoever we are, whatever our... Yeah. I mean, there's also, it's not it's not only genders, obviously diversity as well. And BAME community is grossly disproportionately obviously disrepresented in, 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 in with within the within the profession. And you also tend to find again the women um, and ethnic minorities will be pushed more to certain areas of the law, which are looked at in a kind of slightly snobbish way. It's it's almost as if you're working in legal aid cases, you're not perhaps as sophisticated a lawyer, you're not quite as good as if you're in commercial work. And so there's all kinds of ridiculous prejudices and lack of appreciation as well of people who work in public funded work. So I think it's a very complex issue we need to tackle a lot of these stereotypes as to what men can do they can they can just out there support the female colleagues they should look at if they're invited to speak on a panel which is all male and manal they can refuse you know they can input on that they're part of that panel so they can input on, onto the di- lack of diversity on that panel and they might only be small steps but it starts to get people thinking in a in a different way and that in itself will affect and influence the audiences there when they're looking at um a reflection on the panel and they'll think well okay that person as well if they're doing that well maybe I can do that whereas I remember you used to go to all these panels and they were all people who would just seem entirely inaccessible to me and so probably that's why I, I, I for a long time carried a lot of self-doubt because they were just from different worlds. Yeah I feel the same. Now mm-hmm. You, you and your chambers have been leaders in me, in many respects about various different aspects of the law, uh, and I wonder when do you ever get any downtime? What, what what do you do for your well being? You know, burnout is high in the profession. We've all got colleagues who left. Yeah, um, the retention isn't brilliant. It's getting better. What what do you do for well being? And maybe any tips that. Um, uh, I know I'd probably drink too much, don't run enough, uh, not enough yoga, even now on COVID. Could you share perhaps something, that, you know, what you do for, I hate the word work-life balanced. Yeah. But, you know, what do you do and, and how do you find balance? Yeah, I, I mean, a bit like you, I think we, we all look at our lives very differently to the, you know, here's your work and here's your life. And it, and it probably used to be to address much more the, you know, more of a, more of a, a rigid structure. But I, I, I don't think that, I mean, one advantage of the bar is that with us all being self-employed, there's always been a lot more fluidity on your hours in that you could end up with a day off in the middle of the week. So we've never been that strict on, you know, here's, oh, great, here's the weekend. And now here's my working week. It, 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 you know, your weekend can be all work and, and things can change in the working week. So I've always, I think, as a, as a self-employed person, I've always enjoyed that freedom of my work being in different spaces not in a not in a massive structure I've always I mean I I I was kung fu I practiced in kung fu for years that was that was really big pastime of mine and I I would be going like sometimes five times a week I mean I was proper martial artist and then I I did a recent slightly more gentle in recent years my thing at the moment is dance and I love salsa and bachata and that's very much because I spent a lot of time in in Colombia and that's where I learned that's where I was introduced to dance and I'm not a dancer and I never thought I would be able to dance in the way that I now can and I just love it and it's endless as to as to what you can learn yeah oh fantastic who are your role models or mentors and what role do you think that they can play 
I have been asked this before and I wish I had a real answer of one person that I really felt oh you know more than that I really felt, I want to be like that person but I just didn't I think I was you know coming through that time when there weren't really those people around I think it's much better now and there weren't people really for me I felt the same that I could really aspire to I mean I, I've met Helena Kennedy much later on in, in life before before I moved to, to Doughty Street and, and, you know, she's absolutely wonderful, but she wasn't really within my kind of, you know, sphere because when I started at the bar, I basically followed who would give me a, a scholarship because I wouldn't have been able to afford to come. So I started off in a, a civil civil set, commercial set. My first case was in, in uh, it was a shipping case. Uh, sorry, it was in the company's court. So, you know, I, I, I started off uh, in a very different world and I had a lot of opportunities though that the the people who gave me the breaks were that first chambers it was then two crown office row it's now Littleton Chambers but they without them they offered me a pupillage and I was not a fit for them at all and they also gave me a, a, a pupillage award and and this was a time when not everybody got awards there weren't many around and uh, without that, I mean, I, I don't know what would have happened. And and so my pupil supervisor, who I, I'm still in touch with, he really supported me. And then subsequent to that, my pupil supervisor in my second six months, a barrister called Will Holland, he practiced in common law, then particularly in family law. And again, he, he gave me that opportunity. My first pupil supervisor was Anthony Sendall. So I think those people, they're, they're not role models, but they helped me. And in that kind of quiet way that you don't necessarily appreciate when you're younger, you just kind of think, great, I'm entitled to be here. <laughs> so, but actually, they opened the doors. So, And then subsequently, I've had help from others because it was quite difficult for me to get a foot in a chamber's and get tenancy in a, in a stable. It took me a number of years to do that. And there was another barrister called Philip Matthews, who's, who became a judge, but he was against me in a case and he asked me where I, which chambers I was in. I was then squatting and he said, oh, you know, you should, you should come and join us. And so that's when I really started. I wasn't too bothered before that because I wasn't even sure I'd stay at the bar. So I was, you know, I do very well. I got a really good practice. And I was thinking, oh, I'll become a journalist or do something else. And, um, and so probably I started to really take it seriously when I joined Francis Taylor Building, which was a common law set. And I, I, I did a whole range. And then I, I you know, moved. I did more crime, more international. And then it sort of moved. It's moved again to much more public law, international less crime so I think the good thing with the bar as well is you can move around within it and in the different areas of law without the changing job uh, in, in itself so you can develop yourself and grow as a barrister which is one thing that really appeals to me yes I wonder just on that very quickly the start that you had not straight away in crime I you know and the, the common law pupillage as I did you know, nowadays, at the bar especially, and solicitors, are much more specialised. Do you think that is what sort of gave you the strength and that skill that, you know, one, one week you're in the mercantile courts and then the next week you're doing a family case or a PI um, as we all started? So that when one did the criminal cases, actually you had a grounding and the ability to, to adapt. Do you think that that was uh, a yeah. I mean, there's always the, you know, are you are you a jack of all trades and you know master of none used to be used to be the the, the kind of phrase. And I, you know, I, I just remember the different periods of the bar that when I started, in fact, there was a lot more of, of of common law practitioners, and then there was a phase of everybody was starting to specialise. Actually, now I think it's it's going back to people being more generalists uh, and that partly is a reaction to the legal aid cuts that people need to be able to 
make a living. And so they need to be able to uh, work in, in, in different areas, sort of at, certainly, certainly outside crime. But I mean, my first criminal trial, Crown Court trial, I'd never been in a Crown Court before. I'd never seen anywhere in the Crown Court. And then suddenly I was there, uh, you know, there was a jury and I still remember it very distinctly. It was a, it was a theft and a, but, and a threats to kill. It was a guy went into a sports shop on Oxford Street and he and it was a big spat over him and he he was trying to take some trainers back and uh it was the yeah, theft of a theft of a pair of trainers and he flashed a knife and issued a threat so that was the threats to kill which was the big one that you you didn't want to be convicted of that obviously because that was the one with a heavy prison sentence and and so i remember that very distinctly my first criminal trial he was acquitted on the threats to kill i was very happy about it but um i i found the whole thing at how jury i mean yeah, I, I was far more startled than they were. <laughs> but I think in answer to your question, it does, it, it's given me, I'm not frightened of working in different areas. And my drafting, I think, has, has definitely still got those skills from working, you know, in that drafting particulars of claim and, and, and working in that, in that civil, civil law area in, the, in those early years. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I always ask this, um, do you have a favourite fictional lawyer and why? And uh, do you do you have a favourite book maybe you could share with us? Yeah, I mean, the, the fictional lawyer, I was thinking about it because I've always loved Rumpole just because it was the programme that was on when I was a lot younger and it was you know, Leah McKern and, the, the you know, watching watching his brilliant acting and, and it was funny and amusing but in some ways I don't like those kind of barristers so much so I, if I can have a sort of second one I I, I mean everybody must say like Atticus Finch in the Mockingbird but there, there was some beautiful lines in that and I've seen the film as well quite a number of times so I would go for him I mean you know that the sort of wonderful lines about you know, when he's explaining to Scout that you you don't kill the mockingbird. I mean, it's. I remember, I, you know, reading it as a child, and it and it really resonating with me. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Is there a, do you have a favorite book or a book that's had a real impact on you? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I I I love books, and and I for a, a good decade, actually, a long time, over a decade, I've I've. Uh, been a reviewer of the books of books for the time so twice a year I review it's like your summer picks and your book picks for over the festive period and I've always enjoyed doing that and you know I used to you always had a free reign on what, on what you could you know which ones you you wanted to select and, and um so I've always I've always been really interested but I think it, you know to pick one book is really hard because you know, one that's had an impact, I think they have impacts on you different times of your life and, and kind of get you through different things. And I still always hark back to, it's probably the first time I really discovered that kind of literature, which just made me slightly shocked about things. And actually Dickens, I mean, Dickens was such a brilliant storyteller and about London, which, and I've grown to love London with uh, coming to London from from you know, little place near Chorley. I found it just so huge and, and incomprehensible. And I never thought I would stay in London. And I think the storytelling of of, of Dickens, so Bleak House, I, I would go for every time. I mean, it's got everything in it. It's got that that unfairness, I think, which is what I've always had, you know, and, and, the, and the, you know, the John Dice and John Dice. And there's some wonderful passages in Bleak House. And actually talking about it now, I need to go back to it. Yeah. Yeah. No, interesting, interesting. Um, Kirsty, I'm getting near the end of my millions of questions, but <laughs> as we approach them, I, I wonder if you had perhaps three tips or guidance or advice for those starting in the law uh, and perhaps uh, those who are in our profession about remaining in the law. The advice I was always given starting as a pupil was this is your time to ask questions and no question is 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 too basic. And I think that advice is good advice, that when you're thinking about um, entering the profession and also perhaps starting off, 
that's the time to ask. And not just to ask on maybe practicalities, but be, I think, be intellectually curious and always be open to other possibilities. Because one thing that has happened, I think, certainly within the, the, the bar, and, and particularly within international law, is it's, it's expanded so much as a workplace, as an accessible place for people to make really interesting careers. So I think as well, you probably should be quite quite true to yourself early on as to what you're good at within within the law. I mean, so many people will say I'm a lawyer, but that's massively broad. And if you're a barrister for me, why I wanted to be a barrister, I like the court work and I think I'm good in court. I think that's, you know, that's, and I, I feel comfortable in court. I enjoy that. And I also enjoy the intellectual rigor of the the law and the analysis of of issues that and, and perhaps you ch- you know changing the law like, you know changing things which aren't right and, and there's sort of challenge behind it so I've kind of I've sort of found a something that I kind of fit in but that doesn't necessarily mean that it always has to be exactly where I am now and so you can take those skills and what you enjoy and you could be deploying them in, in, in some other arenas. Um, so you, you you mentioned, I think, early on about my chambers and you can see in Apple Street, you've got people like Keir Starmer and he's a typical, perhaps, example of somebody with very, very successful as a QC. He then deploys his skills and moves perhaps more slightly more into policy to try and shape the law more as a DPP and then he moves into politics to try and shape policy people's lives in a wider a wider way and perhaps you know moving more to a socioeconomic impact as, as well as as well as impact through specific cases so I think always always just keep your mind open to opportunities and gosh you're going to get knocks you're going to you're going to mess up you're going to fail at things but everybody does and if you can learn from it really that's that's probably the, the way forward, hard as it might be at the time. Yes, that's great, great advice. Your Queen's Council, I see you frequently commenting on the law on uh, television uh, and radio. Remember, I think you were on Jeremy Vine, uh, however long ago, correcting him on a few things, uh, <laughs> assisting the public, which is great. I just wonder what the future holds. I'm asking because I see that the brilliant Lady Hale has retired from the Supreme Court, so maybe the bench. Uh, I'd certainly like to see you there, as would uh, uh, our twelve thousand plus listeners. Well, you, you're 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 very kind and and very generous with what with what you're saying. But I I I don't see the the bench as as really where, where I I I would end up. A, a huge huge admiration for judges, and I can also see the appeal to. to I mean, it's, it's another career to to then go off and 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 to to achieve. A real height as, as a judge and it, it must be amazing to have had the career of somebody like Lady Hale and there she is you know the first woman in the in the Supreme Court and and dealing with all these brilliant cases but I, I'm very I'm very kind of international and I, I'm I love working in different countries and I, I, I'm very drawn to the vulnerability the need uh, in other countries, and and if I feel I can perhaps, assist, I feel I'm in a privileged position to try and assist. So I also love media, being part of you know calling out things which I think are outrageous, and you would have far more restrictions on that, obviously, as a judge. But I think what 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 I'm looking to to do, kind of in the immediate future, is I'd like to write a book. And I've, I've been talking about this for at least three years. So I think if I keep saying it, then it might actually become a reality because, of course, there's always something else that's kind of getting in the way. But um, I, I just some of the experiences, I mean, the work, you know, I, I had about 10 years training in child rights in Nigeria. And it's a place like Nigeria is so close to my heart. And there's so many kind of wonderful stories from there. And the same with, with Colombia and, 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 and Jamaica. And I was, I've been uh, you tribunals in Antigua and, and in, in Trinidad. And just, just some of those kind of experiences. And I, 
I, I don't know whether it would be in memoirs because I'm not so sure about that. But yeah, I, I kind of would quite like to to just have a bit of space to think and reflect. And, and do you know what it's like at the bar? You just kind of slightly run from one case to the next. So oh, I, yeah. Yeah, so so near future, what I'd like to be is 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 become a a really good salsa batata dancer with a book that people would like to read. Kathy Brimlow, Queen's Council. Thank you so much. We look forward to reading the book and hearing all your stories and wise experiences. I'm so delighted that you were able to join me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. I think this is really fantastic and it's great to support it. So thank you. A huge thank you to Kirsty Brimlow for taking part in Talking Law. Thank you again for listening to Talking Law with me, Sally Penny. Do connect with me on Twitter at Sally Penny One. We'd love it if more people heard our podcast. So if you could spare just a couple of minutes to leave us a review, that will help people find us. Until the next episode, do check out the latest Women in the Law UK book. It's a look at how far the profession has come in the last hundred years, featuring career and well-being advice from women and men. It's available now on Amazon. Just search for Talking Law by Sally Penny. And don't forget to visit us at womeninalawuk.com for all the latest news about our organisation. We look forward to connecting with you. Talking Law was produced by Sam Walker and is a What Goes On Media production. Bye for now.